Okay, let's, uh, let's call this meeting to order. Uh, welcome to the July 28th Planning Commission meeting. Let's go ahead and begin with the flag salute. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, let's do a roll call, please. Commissioner Haugi. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Woodward. Here. Commissioner DeMatte. Here. Commissioner Dahlgren. Here. Commissioner Herzog. Here. Thank you. All right, welcome everyone. Today's planning commission meeting is open to in-person attendance and may also be observed online through the Placer County website. In an effort to encourage the public to engage in the process, our public comment for this meeting will be offered in person and through a remote virtual process. Citizens who wish to comment virtually today should be prepared to comment via the Zoom platform. To join online, click on the link at the Planning Commission homepage. Please make sure your microphone is muted. You may also call in using your toll-free numbers to hear the meeting at 888-788. 0099 or 877-853-5247. And please enter the webinar ID, which is 867-0178-0855. Please press star six to mute yourself. If you'd like to make public comment virtually, please raise your hand with the hand icon at the bottom of the page. If you're calling in, please press star nine to raise your hand. Please be prepared to speak at the time I open public comment for the specific item you would like to address, which can include public comment for matters not on the agenda, a consent item, or a timed item. If attending a person today, we kindly request that once you have commented on your item, return to your seat or leave through the hearing room exit only door to accommodate for physical distancing and allow for others to provide in-person public comment. Each commenter will be entitled to three minutes. Thank you for your patience as we work to preserve the safety and health of all meeting participants and ensure that each citizen who wishes to comment has the opportunity to do so. Let's go ahead and move on to... Chair, if I could just before you move on to something, I, I just wanted to clarify the webinar ID number for those uh, listening online. The webinar ID would be 831-6089-6987. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I don't, I'll read it slower. Uh, the webinar ID would be 831-6089-6987. So the one that's identified in the slide uh, is not correct. Don't use that one. Use the one I've just read in. Thank you. And if you have any troubles, let us know. Okay, uh, EJ. Uh, Director report. All right. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, good morning, <laughs> members of the Commission, EJ Avaldi, Planning Services Division. Uh, to start out, I uh, just want to let you know that the county held its first public workshop on the Auburn Bowman Community Plan update. That was on July 19th. We only had about 18 people attend, which was pretty a pretty low turnout. That was after we had our uh, public information office send out notice and. We also had a uh, KCRA3 actually did a segment on their news too, and we still only had 18 folks uh, uh, turn out. Uh, but even with that, we did get some good feedback. Uh, uh, some of that was about the desire to maintain the rural character of the Auburn Bowman area, uh, the need for a complete sidewalk network, uh, the need for more accessible park rec and recreation facilities, uh, particularly near the Bowman School and then uh, there was a desire to have less, uh, less hotels, uh, especially up in the Bowman area. Uh, so if you recall, this effort is funded by a grant from the Sacramento Area Council of Governments, the Regional Early Action Planning Program. Uh, the purpose of that uh, was to facilitate the development of more infill housing and related transportation improvements, uh, primarily in the Bowman area. So uh, this will eventually uh, come to your commission. Uh, we'll do workshops, of course, before uh, we get to the point where uh, there's any consideration and that's uh, but that's going to be several months down the road so just a heads up on that uh, reminder uh, upcoming board meetings uh, we have a lot of appeals going to the board that went through your commission August 9th we have the Bayside Fields appeal 
uh, going before the board August 23rd, the 3M Event Center, and then going into September, September 13th, uh, the Buck Salvage Parcel Map Modification. Uh, so we will report out on those as the board hears those items. For Planning Commission, uh, next uh, scheduled commission meeting is August 11th. It's a full agenda. Uh, Gateway Village is proposed. That's a 27 lot single family subdivision, residential subdivision in the Auburn area. Uh, we have the Alpine View Estates project, which is uh, uh, 10 duplex units and five workforce housing units up in Tahoe Vista. Uh, we have the first small lot uh, map for Placer Ranch, which is 769 single family residential lots. And then Silver Sage subdivision in Riola Vineyards uh, is 280 single family residential lots. Uh, so that's at the next meeting, August 25th, uh, to be determined what's gonna be on that agenda. And then as I mentioned last time, we are settling on a date for September 22nd for our Tahoe Planning Commission meeting. And that's all I have this morning. Okay, any questions? Uh, can I make a quick comment? Honest, it'll be quick. You guys love my comments, but uh, <laughs> sure. listen, I, know, I owe somebody an apology. I, uh, I, we received a, a memo uh, a couple of days ago that, uh, from Shauna Purvines that I thought was in fact uh, a current memo. And in fact, it was not. It was more than a year old. So uh, being more than a year old, the context of that mem memo makes perfect sense. Obviously, if it had been current, it would have been uh, a different story. So. I, I apologize publicly to Shauna for my misunderstanding. It was my mistake. Okay. Excellent. Okay, let's go ahead and move to public comment for items not on the agenda. Anyone here in person wish to speak on an item or uh, on something that's not on our agenda today? You went online? I'll wait for a little bit of delay. Is anyone online? Are there is the are there people online right now? Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and move to uh, consent agenda items. Would any commissioners like to poll consent agenda items? Not seeing any. Anyone from the public wish to poll a consent agenda item? Okay, well we can entertain a motion for consent. I make a motion. Second. Second. Do it first and second. We'll do a roll call vote on this. Second was Woodward? Yes. Yeah, Woodward, yeah. Thank you. I have a first from Commissioner Johnson and a second from Commissioner Woodward. Commissioner Haugie? Yes, other than I have to abstain from the minutes from the last meeting, I was not at the meeting. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Yes. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Abstain. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and move on to our first timed item. Headquarter place conditional use permit and design site review agreement. Members of the public may now raise their hand or press star nine if you're calling in to begin queuing for public comment on this item, which will not begin until the item presentation is complete. Patrick Dobbs, senior planner, will be presenting on this item. Welcome, Patrick. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I'm Patrick Dobbs, Planning Services Division. This item is the proposed headquarter place, conditional use permit and design review agreement. Project site is located at 14500 Musso Road. Uh, this is north of the intersection of Bell and Musso Road. Uh, on the east side of Interstate 80 in the Bowman area of District 5. The 3.4 acre parcel is split zoned. Uh, approximately 0.7 acres is zoned C2 UP DC. That's general commercial combining use permit, combining design review. The remainder of the site zoned open space. Uh, the applicant is requesting approval of a conditional use permit and design review agreement 
uh, to change the primary land use uh, from a commercial restaurant, this is the former Dingus McGee's Restaurant and Event Center, and to six for rent multifamily residential units. Four of the residential units are proposed in the former restaurant building. Two of the units are proposed in the uh, former event center building. There are just some very minor side improvements, including driveway widening, some repairs to the septic system, minor exterior building modifications regarding doorways and window replacement, but the project primarily involves interior building improvements. Uh, these are shown on the floor plans in attachment D. Uh, this is a zoom in of the site plan. The project parcel is the one with these red buildings outlined here. Um, the subject parcel is currently under common ownership with 10 surrounding parcels. Uh, these parcels have undergone a number of land use changes over time. The site has historically operated as a restaurant, uh, previously the Headquarter House restaurant, and more recently Dingus McGee's Restaurant and Event Center, uh, which closed in January 2022. The Raspberry Hill Golf Course and Driving Range previously operated on portions of the site and surrounding land designated as open space. Uh, the restaurant and golf course opened uh, uh, in the late 70s. In 2012, uh, this uh, RV park to the south was approved. The first phase was constructed about five years ago. The applicant is moving forward with the second phase of, of the uh, park, which is a 20-unit campground site that's no located immediately north of the existing RV park and west of the project parcel. Uh, so the, the site and surrounding parcels contain rolling terrain. Uh, there's golf course greens, man-made ponds, natural vegetation. It's bounded by Interstate 80 to the west, Union Pacific Railroad to the east, uh, open space and residential uses to the north, and the RV park to the south. Uh, the site is developed with two buildings located in the commercial zone portion of the property. Uh, this is the former restaurant building. A couple photos of the former event center building. Access to the site is via an existing driveway uh, located off Musso Road. This is a county maintained roadway. So you probably recall me standing here in the past discussing the housing related code amendments and how future projects like this wouldn't be coming to the Planning Commission, uh, that they'd really only just require a design review. Uh, so you may be wondering why this is before you today, and basically it's because the application was received before these recently adopted uh, housing code amendments. So the application came in in March, the board approved the code amendments in June. As such, this application is being reviewed and processed in accordance with the regulations in effect at the time of the application. Um, I think the outcome would be the same. It, it, it would meet our standards regardless of the old rules or under the rules of the housing related code amendments, just some slightly different standards and process. Uh, but with that being said, uh, the conditional use permit analysis, uh, this is the general commercial zone district, multifamily is a permissible use, in this case subject to the CUP. Uh, the density multifamily is allowed uh, one unit per every 2,000 square feet of area with 0.7 acres zone C2 that could potentially allow up to 15 multifamily units on the site. It conforms with setbacks, coverage, height, parking. The Auburn Bowman Community Plan has a number of goals and policies that promote opportunities for a variety of residential development and housing types, particularly proximate to transportation networks uh, to reduce commuting distances for uh, jobs. So given the comparative level of land use intensity compared to the former restaurant uh, and event center use, and the substantial distance between the existing buildings and the nearest residential neighbors, the, proposal, the proposed land use would be compatible with the existing setting and land use patterns and not disruptive to nearby single family residential properties. As required by the uh, design scenic corridor combining district, the, the um, site design review agreement is required. This project is consistent with the Placer County design guidelines for multifamily residential development and conforms with site planning guidelines related to safe entry drives, building footprints, building clustering and massing, the number of attached uh, units, parking, activity and open spaces and similarly conforms with the applicable multifamily architectural guidelines regarding articulation and projections, energy efficiency, scale, and bulk, uh, well-defined entries, exterior materials, roof types, windows, and screening of mechanical equipment. 
Uh, just earlier this month, on July 12th, we presented the project to the North Auburn MAC. Uh, they voted to send you a letter, and that letter is included in your packet as attachment G. Uh, the North Auburn MAC recommends approval of the change in use with a uh, proposed uh, condition that units only be rented on a long-term basis, so 30 consecutive days or longer. Uh, staff agrees uh, with this recommendation of the MAC, and that is reflected in the conditions of approval. However, I should point out that that is an area of disagreement with the applicant. So we can discuss that further. Uh, okay. There was a, a last-minute change after the packet uh, was printed. This is a change to an engineering and surveying condition number six. Uh, previously required consultation with Caltrans and the railroad. Now it's just being limited to the railroad. And my colleague Candace from Engineering and Surveying can discuss that with you. Uh, staff does support the adaptive reuse of the property to become multifamily residential. And the DRC asks that the Planning Commission take the following actions and find the uh, project is categorically exempt from CEQA pursuant to sections 15301 and 15303 of the uh, CEQA guidelines and Section 183630 and 183650 of the Placer County Environmental Review Ordinance, the CEQA exemptions for the Class I existing facilities and Class III new construction or conversion of small structures. And second, approve the conditional use permit and design review agreement to convert the existing restaurant and event center building into six long-term multifamily residential units supported by the findings and recommended conditions in the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We can answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, questions for staff? Patrick? Okay. You say that the staff agrees with the recommendation from the staff as yes. far as long term rentals? Yes. I mean, it, frankly, it, the issue was kind of daylighted a little later in the process once we went to the MAC. It was never proposed as overnight stays. This is commercial zoning. We would effectively consider that a motel. And we would have treated it differently. And so we, we do support the long-term rental to further Placer County's housing goals. Okay, so that doesn't really have to be included in the uh, use permit? It doesn't mean it has to be. At this point, it's included in recommended condition number one. And I think what I was saying is you can expect when the applicant speaks that uh, he's going to request that that be omitted okay. to provide him more flexibility. Thank you. Any others? Maybe just a point of clarification. Can you speak to how this helps maybe affordable housing? Uh, any, any anticipation of where this might fit in those categories? Um, you know, I don't know what rental rates will be, but they are market rate. These are not deed restricted to any certain income limits. Okay. But, uh, you know, so it, it, it's, it's de facto affordable. It, it's more affordable than if they converted it to a single family residence. Sure. But um, I don't, you know, it, 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 that's the only sense in which it furthers our affordable housing goals is it's okay. multiple, it's multifamily, which by its very nature is more affordable. Okay. Um, just one more check. Can yeah, I have a quick, just a couple quick questions. First, uh, Patrick, did you happen to bring forward in June that this essentially was a four-pronged proposal, as I recall, included um, about 2,000 parcels being rezoned and stuff like that. But that, that was where the streamlining was approved. Is that correct? Yes, I, I believe you're and, referring to the housing-related code amendments. Yeah, yes. and you brought that forward. Is that right? That's, I, I mean, you're very familiar with that. Yes. Okay, so I'm curious about uh, older buildings like this one. So this is a 1970s building. Um, it's going to have some small modifications to the outside and that sort of thing. You indicated, I think, very thoroughly that your view is that the design standards that are currently in place but not applicable based on that new code, right, are the ones that are being used. And yet, when this went through us 10 months ago or whatever, <clears throat> one of my colleagues asked, um, you know, what happens if we don't approve this new set of design standards immediately? And the answer was, well, then Placer County will have none. In fact, that's not accurate. In fact, you used a whole set of standards that you described here to look at this 1970s building, right? I, I would uh, explain it slightly different. What I talked about in terms of meeting these design review 
you know, guidelines. I, I really emphasize guidelines versus standards. So, so you know, these say things like, you know, we encourage safe entry drives, and we, you know, they, these are 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 more permissive. They're 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 less prescriptive, and so by you know the, the new multifamily and mixed use design manual is is codified. It's standardized. So these are there's more flexibility in this. So the the guidelines still exist, but they're if if you know particularly as it relates to affordable housing projects. If a proponent was to challenge on this, it's hard to enforce guidelines. Okay. So I, that's a distinction. Okay. So just a quick question on process, since this is kind of you spelled this out inside. You're, you're, first of all, you're very familiar with this, and secondly, you spelled it out in your in your uh, staff package, so I'm um, comfortable asking this question. Going forward, if we have an old building like this, or an older building, I shouldn't say an old building, but a you know, 1970s vintage building, how, how does staff apply what will be, or are now, in effect, design standards, which we thoroughly reviewed uh, almost a year ago, how is that going to be applied to an older building like this? I mean, the the idea of a standard is that you and I could measure it and come up with this, you know, uh, the, the same result. It's going to be independent of our subjectivity. So these things like setbacks and such or height, you know, it's still going to be applied. But I, I think very, to be very frank, I think the mixed use design manual is really focused on new development. And you know, if there was an opportunity in the future to look at ways to um, have uh, you know a m more clear uh, set of expectations for this repurposing that, that that might be something that should be considered more but okay so that would might potentially be uh, an area a gap perhaps in this the I, policy that we should I mean look again at. that that's just my perspective yeah. is that it was so focused on new development we are you know whether it be commercial or office spaces, I mean, the world is changing and, and we're mm -hmm. having yeah. to adapt. And so I think we're seeing more repurposing, adaptive reuse of structures. And I do kind of personally feel that that is, is a, a, a hole that could be plugged in the design manual better. Okay, so. Um, but nevertheless, the standards, like I mentioned, like a certain amount of landscaping or certain you know limitations on how much of the front yard could be uh, impervious surface. I mean, ideally, we should still be able to measure those standards and and have the same conclusion, okay. whether that project meets it or not. Okay. And final question: uh, Since the uh, it's kind of surprising to me, by the way, that this went forward. You 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 are not aware of this, but you know this is the subject of two CEO meetings and a third uh, scheduled for the eighth of August. Um, so I'm surprised that this went through in June and went to the board of supervisors. But nonetheless. It is what it is, at least for the moment. So um, in the future, assuming that this streamlining process stands, uh, a mixed use or multifamily uh, development uh, could be placed inside of Placer County with no involvement from uh, supervisors or the Planning Commission based on this streamlining proposal. Is that true? Yes, but just to provide uh, you know, a little bit more context. There are already certain zone districts like multifamily residential that wouldn't have, you know, elevated it to, to planning commission or, or board of supervisors. So, you know, there, there are notification requirements to property owners. It's handled at, at a lower level. The design review agreement is basically a zoning administrator action. It's, it's in a public forum, but there certainly are instances if they comply with the guidelines that they would not be coming to the planning commission or board without appeal. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I, I can't tell if Anders has any comments or not, but no. Okay. Okay. I want to um, ask if Michael Reese is here, if he'd like to say something, the applicant. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Michael Reese, and um, I believe staff, uh, Patrick in particular, has done a very good job of describing um, the proposed project uh, that I have before your commission here this morning. And um, so, the, as he's alluded to, the only, um, the, all I'm good with all the conditions, and staff has been very good to work through. We have one uh, small issue that I've just asked for the commission's consideration on, 
And if the commission decides it needs to say, so be it, or good with it, and we'll go with it. But I would just like to ask for consideration on that. And that's specifically that they just limit the long, uh, the sh short term stays. Intention <coughs> has been and continues to be that they're long term rentals. That's the easiest way to do it. <coughs> and that's um, what the intention is. However, with that said, sometimes um, uh, at our RV business that we have, we're full all the time with a waiting list. And sometimes we have a, a clients, guests that need two or three days, you know, just to hang out till somebody leaves. In the event that we had a, a vacancy in one of those units, which I really don't think we will, but it would be nice just to have that flexibility going forward. And the condition um, that they mentioned, and Patrick alluded to it, just really found out about that one or two weeks ago. It wasn't um, during when I initially talked to staff. It wasn't um, when we had our, our pre-development meeting. So that was kind of one consideration. And I guess um, with that said, we really don't know what the future holds. This, I, from what I understand, would be the only multifamily project that would have this condition that's ever been put on it. We're not up in the east area where you know the, the short-term ordinances uh, for uh, short-term stays are in effect. Um, so I guess that would be just another consideration. But again, I hope to gain your approval here this morning uh, with or without the condition, hopefully without, but whatever the commission decides. And I can answer any questions if anybody has any. Okay, questions for the applicant? <laughs> Uh, Michael, where is the next closest option where people stay now? If, if you know, someone needs a day or two, where do they go now? As far as the RV park? Yeah. Um, would it be Gold Country off of 49. Okay. And they're, they're full most of the time as well. So I have a question probably for Patrick. If, if this is... This condition is removed and allowed short term. Does this not then turn it into a bed and breakfast type facility? I mean, I, you know, and then it's I don't to, think by, by default it turns into that, but it, it provides option for short term and long term rentals. And, um, you know, it, it, I mean, Mike is correct that this wasn't something that was really discussed initially because, it, it, frankly, it wasn't raised. It was always. Uh, you know, proposed as, as long-term housing. And so it, this issue kind of got daylighted at the MAC. You know, the, the MAC uh, felt that important to the recommendation and we, we agreed. This is always the way we understood the project to be. And like I said, with this commercial zoning, if it were to be used for nightly rentals, we would think of that as kind of a different land use type, more of the tourist accommodation hotel motel as opposed to multifamily residential. When it's less than 30 days, it kicks into a hotel tax. Does the hotel tax benefit Placer County? Or does that go right to the state? I don't know. Does the applicant know this? Okay, thank you. I may and may have some info on this and may not. Uh, the transient occupancy tax that's in place does benefit the county, but I believe that's only in the Tahoe area and wouldn't apply to this area. I'm just not 100% sure on that. Okay. Um, in that instance, then any taxes, if, it, if the TOT area does not apply, then any taxes would be going to the state, not the county. Okay. I thought it went to the county, but I just wanted clarification. Okay. Is it true that nowhere else in this community this requirement exists? Is, is it, would this be very unique for this structure and building project? I guess I would say, I mean, I, you know, um, <laughs> all projects have unique aspects of it, but I'm not aware of another project that has this long-term rental stipulation. But again, I don't know how many multifamily projects we've seen in commercial zoning recently. Yeah. Um, so, and it, there's another factor I think worth considering here. So this parcel was part of the parcels rezoned in June as part of that uh, larger um, county zoning amendment uh, to eat 
to ease restrictions on multifamily. So if this parcel were to come forward now, today, had it been submitted beforehand, it would not need a use permit because it was rezoned out of that use permit requirement for this multifamily. So if it were to come forward today, it would not need a use permit, which would also mean then we would not have the opportunity to condition it and include a condition like this. So um, this is only because it came in before and there is a use permit in front of you that you're evaluating this, but if this project were to come in yeah, today, you wouldn't have this opportunity to then say whether or not it could be restricted to short-term or long-term. They would be allowed multifamily on a short-term or long-term basis. Okay. Patrick, a quick uh, question. I, my apologies. I'm sure you said it. I, which specific condition are we talking about here? It, it said the, the last sentence on condition one. Oh, okay. on paper, But it basically says, that, you know, no unit should be rented for less than 30 consecutive mm -hmm. days. Something about it. Page 19 in your packet. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions for the applicant or staff? I'm going to open up public comment and then we can bring them back up if we need to. Uh, let's go ahead and open up public comment. Anyone here in person wish to speak on this item? Okay. Sure, please come up and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes. Yeah, my name is Garen Kendall, and uh, I live out. I'm a resident out there where this uh, property is all being talked about, out there off of Musso Road. I'm out behind all of this, and I'm kind of representing the neighborhood. Everybody is, is working today. It's kind of, we're all kind of pissed off that it's being called it in, in the morning while everybody's at work, so we don't get to have our say about then basically the neighborhood is really not happy about the way things are going with this more so because of the, the excess traffic and even the more people that are going to be milling around out in the neighborhoods that um, the one property that borderlines the uh, the golf course he's concerned about the, even the traffic coming from the trailer park people that are coming up along the, the canal and just walking right across his property and uh, right along the canal and with this new multi-use or not multi-use but with this new residential uh, zoning it's nobody's happy about it <laughs> i'm, I'm kind of cutting in here cold so uh, i'm just voicing our opinion that uh, this needs to be rethought or, or, so we can all come together as a neighborhood to be able to present our case instead of kind of getting blindsided on all this because we didn't know any of this was going to happen because of the way the sign was signage was set up uh, we didn't know until two weeks ago and um, the way this whole thing has been kind of we've kind of been ghosted out and we aren't too happy about it you guys have any questions for me i don't think so uh, yeah see you later excuse me i might Sorry, I might have some questions later. Not right now. Though. Oh, okay. Thank, Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Anyone else here in person? Anyone online? Okay, we'll go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to the commission for discussion. If we have to bring back up staff or the applicant, we can. <clears throat> but let's go ahead and begin our discussion on this item. <clears throat> I guess the only thing I was thinking was that um, the last resident here, I believe is a resident there, and is concerned with traffic. If there's been traffic studies done that maybe the public should know about that maybe Patrick can answer this, that I would imagine there'd be less public traffic with residents than there would be for having a commercial um, building yeah. there with a uh, restaurant that can serve <clears throat> probably within 500 people coming through there in a day. Yeah, that, uh, thank you, Commissioner. There were no additional traffic studies. Again, you know, we're, we're trying to facilitate housing and streamline this, so we see it the same way in terms of a you know, less intense use. Uh, certainly there's less trips that will be coming to and from the site than when it was a 
bustling restaurant. Right. The toilets will be flush, flushed less, all those sort of. Now, we do understand that, um, you know, that in the past the restaurant closed, and, and this is different in the sense that people will be living there and could be there at all times. So uh, we're um, aware of that, but again, give, given the distance of neighboring parcels and such, uh, you know, this is, we view this as a less intense use, and so those concerns about traffic and stuff, uh, there was no additional analysis on that given the, the change from commercial to residential. Okay, thank you. Maybe we could start with uh, the condition of approval on item one. Maybe we could discuss that as, as a group and see where we stand on that before we talk about approval. Um, seems as though there's a question whether or not that, that should exist. What do you guys think? Well, in terms of fairness to the applicant, if they were to withdraw their application now and reapply, it wouldn't be before us and that wouldn't be a condition. And this sets a precedent for the Bowman area as a precedent for short-term rentals. So it was never seen as the opportunity for short-term rental. It was always seen as multi-use family. And it's zoned for such because of the zoning changes. So I don't see why we, I understand why the MAC wants it in, and why the neighbors want it in, but I don't see that it's our purview. Well, it is our purview, but I don't see the need for it. I agree with those comments. I tend to agree with them as well. And I'll just make a quick comment, generally speaking, about um, this. Uh, I think this is a terrible policy. I always have, and I will continue to fight it until there's no fight left in me because I think that removing uh, supervisors and planning commissioners from what I consider to be major land use decisions in Placer County and uh, concentrating them these decisions inside of staff which are not elected, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way in any way, shape, or form. It's simply a, you know, that's state, just a statement of fact. I think it's very bad policy. So this is the first example, and it'll be the last one we see because none of this stuff is going to come to us anymore anyway. And so my supervisor is going to get phone calls asking what's going on with this particular parcel or whatever, and I'm not going to have a clue, and nor is she, because it's all going to be done by the staff. Nonetheless, uh, you know, we're kind of bound by the rules that are currently in place. And this went through uh, the Board of Supervisors in June. So I think we've got to apply those uh, guidelines to some degree, even though they don't necessarily apply to this specific parcel uh, or this proposal right now. So I agree with my colleague here. Uh, you know, I, I think we have to be fair to this particular app and move forward with it. So by being fair, you want to waive the condition of limited term? Yeah. Let them have two night stays, one night stays? Yeah, Is that I, what I'm hearing? I'm trying to wrap my head around. Yeah, I mean, it, as Robin points out, and as was pointed out by Clayton as well, which was pretty helpful, we, if this were, if this applicant came forward six months from now, it, right. it would be, we would never even know this. It would right. just be done. Gotcha. And so it's kind of hard to set that aside right now. Again, for the citizen here, I am 100% in your court. I think this is terrible policy. It reflects bad, bad policy by, the, by Placer County, and we need to fix it, and hopefully we can. I'm going to try. I have a question for the speaker. If you want to come back to the mic, please. You, you, you mentioned that you and your neighbors are not happy with this becoming a residential Well, place. just the way that it's kind of all been been done to, to us. As I had stated, that we didn't even know about this, uh, this meeting or even the one on the 25th, um, I think mm -hmm. it was, the, uh, at, in the evening uh, until just two days before because of the way the signage, there was the sign of the property being for sale. Mm -hmm. But as far as the, the county meeting, we didn't even know that until that Friday 
when somebody happened to be walking because the, the placement was not out in front for public view. It was put out behind the sign. I drove up there that day, Friday, and, and I saw, oh, you know, which Mr. Reese knows all too well, he's done enough development that you would put it out in the front. So we got blindsided by all this. So we're, we've been scrambling to try to put our ducks in a row to present a, a cohesive case about the rezoning uh, because there's the way the neighbors, okay, this could put the, the restaurant, if it's gonna get rezoned and then the future down the road of more residents because of the one property that butts up, he's already getting more people walking through his property that just because of the trailer park. I'm on the other side of the tracks and our neighborhood has been having a lot of walk through people and, and they come onto our properties where they're open properties and, and people just kind of, oh, this is nature and you know, all due respect to them. But we're, and there's been some more break-ins just because of the trailer park, let alone that, you know, if there's gonna end up being down the road more high density, even long-term residence is something that we're gonna have to come to terms with. But most definitely the short term is something that would just, you know, would, there's always gonna be somebody different coming out and always somebody coming next door and then gone and uh, uh, Jim Kale, who butts up to that property, his concern is about theft. Okay. Um, I'm sorry for writing late, ladies and gentlemen. That's me. Oh, this, uh, Jane, the, this is a, can I turn? Uh, no. Uh, okay. That would have to refer okay, to fair enough. the chair. So I, I called you up because I just had a question about you were concerned with your neighbors about having more foot traffic come through your property. Where I look at it as, it's more foot traffic is what be, I meant. Right, but there should be less foot traffic if, if people are permanently living there for 30 plus days. You may have a family of four living there. You're not going to have a restaurant that's going to bring in 400 people or 200 people every other day. With that's, maybe possibly walking around after they go have dinner through your neighbor's yards because it's not fenced off. So that well, was when you said that you were worried about a plethora of people coming through your yard and your neighbors, and this was going to become now maybe subject to more crime. I, I don't see that. There's no, I don't see stuff. Well, from the restaurant point of view, people are just, they're coming in, getting dinner, and they're leaving. You have long term, I, my, I have a, my house, a house right next door to me is, is an Airbnb, and I've had people coming in and out. There's always people coming, nice enough. But I've had people come walking around the neighborhood, come walking right up in, up into my house, which is a hundred yard driveway. And they're just, and I tell them, what are you doing here? Oh, well, just, they're, they're just people just kind of walking around and not saying that they're criminals, but I have heard that there have been more break-ins uh, from other neighbors who unfortunately because of work haven't been able to be here today to state their case. So I'm just going by what they're telling me. Okay, all yeah. right, thank you. I appreciate your comments. Chair, if, if I might briefly, um, I think we might be having a little bit of a technological issue with the live streaming. Okay. So um, if it's okay with the commission, I would ask that we take a five-minute break to see if we can resolve those issues. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's uh, take a break then. How, how long ago did that happen? Okay. Yeah. I, we're looking into it. I don't, I don't know. Okay. We'll take a five-minute break. Sorry, guys. We have online issues. Take a break. If I could just make a brief comment. Uh, yeah, my understanding is that the the YouTube link uh, for this uh, planning commission meeting is uh, they're having some sort of technical issue with it. Uh, but this meeting is still okay to proceed because the YouTube link is uh, not listed on the agenda. It's not part of the means to provide public comment for the meeting. Uh, it's just, a, I guess, an added feature that the county uses as another means that people can watch this. But uh, for legal compliance purposes, the, the Zoom platform is functioning, and anyone interested in commenting can still comment on the Zoom platform, so we're okay to resume. Okay, to be fair, um, I'd like to offer that we reopen public comment for this item. Any commissioners have an issue with that? Okay, I'll go ahead and reopen public comment. Uh, I understand there's someone that would like to speak. Come up and share your name. Uh, you have three minutes. All right, first of all, thanks for uh, allowing me to speak today. My name is James Kale. Um, I own the property uh, directly next to um, what used to be the golf course and uh, Dingus McGee's restaurant there. Um, 
I realize it's a changing world that we've got a uh, need for uh, more housing. Um, my concerns are uh, the way the property is laid out over there. Um, anybody can get to my property and they can do it in um, complete cover. Um, I have two teenage daughters and we've had uh, two 911 calls from our house. Um, one with somebody trying to get into the house that came from over there. And uh, the other time it was somebody that had come over the fence from that side as well and was trying to grab some of my equipment. I have a small painting and drywall business. Um, I was in the, uh, the Christmas parade the first time and couldn't hear my phone ringing as my daughter was trying to get a hold of me and you know someone was trying to get in. And uh, it's, uh, it's scary for me as a father. And uh, I, uh, I guess I might feel a lot better about this if the property was secure, but you're talking about hundreds of feet of fence line. Um, and then my other problem is that, you know, once there is permanent residents here or other, the, you know, low income housing doesn't mean bad people, but there is people that may come to visit and you don't know who they are or where they're from. And um, the more people that come in and out, the more people that are parked in that parking lot, there is no policing of the area as far as, as are these people supposed to be here or not. I mean, if it's an apartment complex, then, you know, you can pull in, I could pull in over there. No one's going to say anything to me. Nobody knows what my intentions are. And um, you can walk right to my back door. You know, um, there's a PCWA canal. There's a trail in complete cover going right from there all the way to my house. Um, there's access to the train tracks where we get a lot of, you know, people wandering by right on the backside of that property as well, where you could come across from the train tracks in complete cover and get right to my backyard. Everything ends up right in my backyard. We've had two situations that were, uh, very scary for us as a family and um you know what would have happened if uh that person had gotten inside my house you know what i mean um i think these are valid concerns that should be taken seriously uh yeah the traffic is an issue um i can tell you from mr what i heard what uh, mr kendall was saying and we never had an issue when the restaurant was there there was never any foot traffic people walking after dinner or anything like that but um, since the restaurant shut down, there has been activity over on what used to be the golf course there. People can get out there. You know, there's people from the, the, that, uh, the new RV park that, that are often out there. Sometimes I catch them looking over the fence. Not that they're doing anything wrong, but, you know, certainly invading the privacy there. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, I just wanted a chance to share that with you guys today. So I appreciate your time. That's all I got. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I have a quick question for the applicant. It's not low income housing, correct? It's market rate housing. Just yes or no? Thank you. It's market rate, yes. yes. Yeah. Not low income. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, I'm in this. Anyone else here, uh, person, wish to speak? Uh, and then anyone online? Okay, we'll close public comment and continue our discussion. Uh, Patrick, do you have any comments on the comments that were just made? And in particular, I'm curious about this because uh, about are there conditions of approval that might mitigate some of the concerns that were just discussed? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I guess I'll, I'll look through the conditions as I'm answering, but n no, I don't believe so. But but I appreciate you know this his participation and and I you know th those do sound like valid concerns. But we're talking about human behavior, and and we don't control that. But you know th this is significantly buffered from uh, nearby residential neighbors. But but yes, the, the the conditions on site you know in terms of having a canal and train tracks kind of facilitate that more transient nature but but yeah there's curious. nothing requiring a fence be built oh, or there is not it, there's, there's no not. so a fence would not be helpful here I mean I don't have the layout in my mind well as he indicated I mean these are big properties with long shared property lines so I don't know if we're just talking about a segment or you know something more around the perimeter but um you know there is not any conditions in here that specifically address trespass and should there be 
Uh, you know, I guess at the staff level, we didn't think so, but we defer to your decision on it. Okay. Okay, I do. Yeah. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I hear the concern that uh, is being expressed about uh, people walking around. And oftentimes, you don't know where they're from or what they're, who they're connected with. You know, they, they may be at the trailer park. But one of the things that, uh, just to think about, it seems like you have a vacant building there now. And uh, with this proposal, we'll actually have uh, people living there. And it seems to me the security that uh, a vacant building versus people living there would give you more security with the people actually living there than uh, having a vacant building that people can drive up to and do whatever they want, whenever they want. And so that's just a consideration that I'm having. Yeah, yeah I, was, I would agree with you. That was going to be my next comment, is that you have an abandoned building where you're going to have more transient activity, where people are going to go park in the middle of the night. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you put a fence two feet tall or ten feet tall. People want to go around it, go over it, they're going to do it. Like the one neighbor stated that he has people already looking over his fence from the trailer park. I believe that if you put residents in there that are going to take care of their home, it's going to be better than having people just drive up there and park and sit there overnight and do whatever activities they want to do. I would imagine it would become safer because those people, I would imagine who are going to live there, are not going to want that in their backyard either. So I would imagine that they would probably could be good neighbors. Like you said, it's not going to be low-income housing. You're going to have market-rate housing, which is very expensive in this area right now. I don't think market-rate housing is going to bring transient activity or criminal activity. So, you kind of see it in a good way, hopefully, for the neighbors. Their part. That's all. Yeah. We can uh, move to a motion. Uh, think about that first item. Can we go back to the. Um, That's right. Oh, it's Can we put it on our screen? Yeah, we don't have it on our screen here. Make it easier for. Yep. Thank you. If there is commission interest on modifying that first condition of approval, um, the applicable sentence is the last sentence of the condition of approval number one. So, on page um, if you were interested in removing that provision, you would just uh, your motion would include removal of the last sentence of condition of approval number one. I'm and, just. Just go ahead, Clayton. Uh, for purposes of the motions to, uh, that would apply to the second recommendation that's up there on the, the board, the conditional use permit, which would be uh, approved subject to the conditions of approval, and that would be as modified uh, for condition of approval number one, and staff has also included an errata for condition of approval number six. So you would just, um, in the motion for that, you would be including that uh, the conditions of approval as modified according to those provisions. And my concern is just for the short-term ordinance that doesn't exist in Bowman that we would making it for one particular property. And I don't know that that's the kind of precedent that we want to set. I understand the reasoning behind it, and perhaps the entire community wants to approach that with the challenges they're having with current Airbnbs, that they come up with a short-term ordinance for that area, but not to be one particular property that we designate having a 30-day rental requirement so you're saying to allow the overnight stay I'm saying not to restrict not to restrict because it doesn't exist in other properties it doesn't exist in other properties in that same neighborhood that same area gotcha so it wouldn't be fair wouldn't be fair okay Okay, so that means that the motion or the uh, recommendation stands as written, right, from your perspective? I believe it stands as Clayton mentioned, and it's a complicated one. So if you could redo, say it, sure. all motion. So uh, the proposal Commissioner uh, Dahlgren's making is that uh, the recommendation under the, the second item would be to approve the conditional use permit and design site review agreement. Um, with the modifications to condition of approval number six suggested by staff and the modification to condition of approval number one to remove the last sentence of that condition. 
Okay. Well, I will make that motion as stated. If if we can go to skip to two. Well, we took them in order. We can do two first. Yeah. Two yeah. can go first, and sounds like we have a motion. Second it. So first and second, we're voting on a recommendation number two. So we'll do a roll call vote. I have a first from Commissioner Woodward and a second from Commissioner DiMatte. Commissioner Hauge? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Woodward? Yes. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Thank you. We would also need a motion for the first item. Yeah. Can we put them on the screen or? I'll just read. Uh, also, I further move that uh, we find the project categorically exempt from environmental review pursuant to sections 15301 and 15303 of the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines and sections 18.36.030 and 18.36.050 of the Placer County Environmental Review Ordinance, uh, Class 1 existing facilities, Class 3 new construction and or conversion of small structures. Second. The first and the second do a roll call vote. I have a first from Commissioner Woodward and a second from Commissioner DiMatte. Commissioner Hauge? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Yes. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Thank you. Okay, the decision of the Planning Commission may be appealed by anyone who appeared at today's hearing and provided comment or anyone that submitted written comments on this item. An appeal must be filed within 10 days of today's date and shall be accompanied by a filing fee of $641. All right, we're going to move on to our second timed item. Wiseman Variance Third Party Appeal. Members of the public may now... Raise your hand, press star nine if you're calling in to begin queuing up for public comment on this item, which will not begin until the item presentation is complete. Stacy Wydra, senior planner, will be presenting on this item. Welcome, Stacy. Hi, good morning. It's been a while. <laughs> okay, to proceed. Okay. Good morning. Chair Herzog and fellow planning commissioners, um, I'm here today to present to you the Wiseman Variance Appeal. And specifically, um, we are asking that you consider the third party appeal filed by Mr. S Stephen DeGange of the Zoning Administrator's April 21st, 2022 decision to approve a variance to allow for a reduced setback to the front, um, ultimately allowing a 1.83 foot setback from the measured from the front property line along Tahoe Street, whereas a 20 foot front setback is required, and a 3.55 foot side setback from the northeast side property line in order for the construction of a new 456 square foot residential accessory structure and to also allow for a six foot tall fence to be located zero feet from the front property line, um, whereas a 20 foot setback is otherwise required. The project site is governed by the Tahoe Basin Area Plan and is specifically zoned the Fairway Track Northeast Residential. And it's located right in here. Um, and you can see that it um, directly abuts the Tahoe City Mixed Use Zone District. Um, so it's, it's basically in an area that is easily accessible to um, the downtown Tahoe City area. And specifically, the project site is located at 300 Grove Street um, adjacent uses consist of a mix, as I mentioned, um, but specifically uh, indirectly near the residence or the, excuse me, the subject parcel um, is residential, an elementary school, a utility building. And uniquely, this um, neighborhood that exists here in this area um, is characterized by older, older homes. Um, this subdivision has been there for quite some time. And then uniquely, um, when researching this project, over well, many years ago, there has been variances that were approved for increased densities, which allowing multiple units on these parcels in this residential zone district. So this is just a quick um, 
bird's eye view of the area and some of the items I described. So here's the residential neighborhood. Um, it's heavily treed, so it's hard to see that there are dense development and a lot of structures in this, in this area. But here's the school, the baseball fields. Um, this is uh, North Lake Boulevard, so basically the commercial row of Tahoe City. Um, and then the lake is in here. So the 5,500 square foot parcel um, does contain two, free, two frontages, um, one off of Tahoe Street and one off of Grove. It is relatively flat, um, but uniquely it does contain what's called a stream environment zone, so an SEZ as I will refer to it throughout my presentation. Um, and that SEZ is actually a component of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, or TRPA. And um, so as you can see, the parcel is primarily consumed by that SEZ. And then this area over here in this corner um, is what we call class five, which is a allowed developable area. Um, but then there is this 10 foot setback from that SEZ that I will discuss further in the staff report. Stacy, sorry to interrupt you. Oh. Uh, we just got yeah, a notification that our, the Zoom platform's down, so. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is today, but I guess I would ask if the chair is oh, inclined to. I can, the Zoom is working fine um, for me. Oh, yeah. Perhaps we take a couple minute break to figure out what the issue is. Okay. We'll take we'll take a five minute break. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, we'll uh, get back in session here. You want to make your comment, or did you just? Sure. Do that? I, I, I can add to it too. I, okay. I think just because we did have some kind of glitch in the middle, I, it may be appropriate for Ms. Weidra to uh, restart her presentation, if that's okay with everyone. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and uh, introduce it. So we're moving on to our second timed item, Wiseman Variance Third Party Appeal. Members of the public may now raise their hand, press star nine if you're calling in to begin queuing in for public comment on this item, which will not begin until the item presentation is complete. Stacey Weidra, senior planner, will be presenting on this item again <laughs> round two <laughs> thank you again um chair herzog and fellow planning commissioners um i'm here today to present to you a third party appeal that was filed by mr deganji um, he is appealing the zoning administrator's april 21st 2022 decision where he approved variance pln 20-00348 to allow for a reduced setback to the front property line along Tahoe Street, whereas a 20-foot setback is otherwise required, and a 3.55-foot side setback from the northeast side property line, whereas a 5-foot side setback is otherwise required, for the construction of a new uh, residential accessory structure and to allow for a 6-foot tall fence located 0 feet from the front property line, whereas a 20-foot setback is otherwise required. The project site is governed by the Tahoe Basin Area Plan and is zoned residential, specifically Fairway Track Northeast Residential, and is located um, right here in this little area here. It does abut the uh, mixed-use town center of Tahoe City. Specifically, the site is located at 300 Grove Street, and adjacent uses consist of single-family, an elementary school, utility buildings, and then it moves on into the commercial core of Tahoe City. This neighborhood uniquely is characterized by older development um, in that in the past there has been increased densities permitted um, through variances um, many years ago before the Tahoe Basin Area Plan was, was uh, implemented. So this is just an overview to get you acquainted of those uses I just um, spelled out. Here's the project site. Um, here's the school, baseball fields. This is a utility building. The neighborhood goes up back into this area, but you can just sort of get an idea um, here is Lake Tahoe, this is the marina, um, and then here is the main road, North Lake Boulevard. So the 5,500 square foot parcel does have two frontages off of Grove Street and Tahoe Street. It's relatively flat, but it does contain a stream environment zone, or an SEZ, um, which is governed by TRPA, the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. But uniquely, um, that SEZ consumes about 4,000 square feet of the parcel, and the remaining balance is shown here um, in this portion of the property. This is what we call Class 5 um, soil type, and the allowable construction you are allowed to build in Class 5 if you have the allowable coverage. Um, and then here is the 10-foot SEZ setback measured from the line of the SEZ. 
The project site is currently developed with a single family residence, single story. It's approximately 945 square feet. Um, here is the existing office and or shed, um, and it is detached from the existing single family residence. There are sheds and decks off of the rear of the property. There's a fence, or fences I should say, that are located along Tahoe Street and Grove. And then two driveways, one off of Grove and one off of Tahoe Street. So the office shed, um, I'd like to get you a little brief history of that. Um, it was built in 1940 um, per the assessor's records. And um, at some point in time, it was converted to a garage by previous owners. And that, or we'll call it a shed from here on out. Um, this shed um, does or is located in the front setback and is approximately 1.83 feet from that front property line. And then also is one foot from the side property line. So encroaching into the front setback um, by 18 feet approximately, and then four feet into the side. The width of the structure currently today is um, just shy of 20 feet, and the length is approximately 18 feet. And then the structure currently does maintain a distance of 15 feet, almost 16 feet, from the edge of traveled way or the edge of pavement to the face of the structure. The fence um, is, does exist currently. Um, it is six feet tall and it is in the front setback and actually is portions of it is in the right of way. Um, but in April 2004, um, a senior, or excuse me, supervising planner determined that that fence was legal non-conforming. Um, and so it can remain in its location provided that it's not enlarged or relocated um, or, or enhanced or increased in height. So um, the original proposal, when the um, applicant submitted with their original proposal, they had um, the idea or their, pr their proposal was to maintain the building in its original location and then approve upon it here. So trying to utilize the existing structure and they um, wanted to just increase the height and then convert the inside into living space. And, um, and then also, you know, asked to keep the fence in the right of, or as is. After discussions with staff, it was determined that, um, and the applicant's engineer, that the structural integrity of that building could not withstand a rebuild. So they had to tear it, or then the next step was to tear it down and rebuild. And then working with staff, because staff had some concerns with the width of it in the front, um, they opted to explore what I will call as proposal number one. And proposal number one, um, they decided to explore an alternative option than their original proposal and um, are proposing to construct a 468 residential accessory structure. Um, again, just consists of the same types of uses, but, um, and then increase the height to 16 feet. So it would be approximate almost five foot increase than what otherwise existed today. And then the, maintain the front setback, but then requested a side setback of 2.5 feet um, from the side setback. So increasing it from its original one foot from the side setback to 2.45 feet. So the existing structure, so basically to summarize that for you really quickly, um, the existing structure is 19, almost 20 feet wide by 18 feet long and was 360 square feet. And then the proposed structure um, reduced in width in the front by 12, to 12 feet and then 39 feet long. And then of course adding additional square footage by that increased size. And so then um, the width of the structure was reduced by 7.9 feet and then the length increased by 20 feet. So the fence, um, which was being considered to be allowed to remain, but again, that non-conforming determination, so any expansions or extensions has to fall under the variance um, approval or re review. And so what the applicants whoops, um, requested is that they wanted to build a fence to fill in the gap of where they were reducing the width of the structure. So that's why the variance is also, or excuse me, that's why the fence is also part of the variance. So the Department of Public Works looked at this proposal um, and agreed that the fence could remain as is, um, also is supporting the uh, extension, if you will, to fill in the gap 
but then also took an opportunity to look at the corner of Grove and Tahoe Streets and has requested of the applicants some improvements to those existing fences so that there's adequate site visibility and distance at that intersection. So uh, we proceeded with pr proposal number one to the March 17th zoning administrator hearing, of which at that time staff had recommended denial. Um, while there was recognized hardships for the front setback, um, staff was unable to make the findings for the side setback due to the fact that it was a teardown rebuild. And so um, at that hearing, the appellant did speak in opposition, um, the same concerns that he has raised with this appeal, and I will go over those later in my presentation. Um, but at that March zoning administrator hearing, the zoning administrator elected to continue the meeting to April 12th and requested that the applicants reconsider or and or redesign or relocate um, based on all of the items that were raised at that March hearing, and then directed staff to prepare findings of approval. So at the April 21st zoning administrator um, hearing, proposal number two was introduced. And proposal number two um, introduced a one foot reduction to the length. The side setback was increased by one foot. So they were now asking for a side setback of 3.55 feet. And then um, increased the portion of the residence about a foot and a half closer to the applicant's residence, and then increased the height just in this middle portion to 16 feet, or I'm sorry, kept the height at 16 feet in this middle portion, but then reduced the height to 14 feet on the sides, basically to give it some articulation. So at the zoning administrator hearing in April, the zoning administrator considered the revised proposal number two and elected to approve the variance as, variances as requested with proposal number two. So the 1.8 foot setback from the front property line, the 3.55 foot setback from the side property line, and the six foot tall fence extension to fill in the gap, um, zero feet from the front property line. And the zoning administrator based his decision um, on understanding that the residential neighborhood um, does sort of already have this characteristics of these detached structures and buildings. Um, while he understood the appellant's concerns, he also acknowledged that even though at the time of the April hearing, the additional dwelling unit or the ADU was not introduced at that time, um, the zoning administrator acknowledged that that is sort of the direction of the state, um, that we're looking at greater densities on these single family residential parcels, and that's further supported by uh, Senate Bill 9. So within the um, filing period for the appeal, um, the appeal was filed by Mr. DeGange on May 2nd, and um, between the timing of the appeal being filed and um, in preparation for today's hearing, the applicants have revised their pro proposal yet again. So proposal number three um, is uh, what I will present to you now. And the applicants have elected to convert the, re the residential accessory structure to an ADU, an additional dwelling unit, of which that ADU can be rented out, provided that it complies with both TRPA standards and Placer counties, and have um, moved it over about six inches to comply with the required four foot setback for an ADU. So uniquely and oddly, um, an ADU takes on a four foot side setback and a residential accessory structure requires five feet. Um, so with that, the applicants withdrew the request for the variance to the side setback. So that is no longer of consideration because they comply should your commission approve the front setback encroachment um, and the six foot tall fence, zero feet from the front property line. So I know that was a lot to, <laughs> to digest, so I thought I'd put in a summary of pro project revision so you can kind of understand the timeline of events. So the first proposal shown here in blue um, is the first proposal where it was 1.83 feet from the side property line. Then the red is moved over to the 3.55 foot request from the side setback. And then the green is the ADU and the four foot side setback. And then you can also see the outline of the structure here. So as a result of moving the um, ADU over by that approximate six inches, 
the pop out got you know moved closer to the proposed resident or excuse me the applicant's residence. So there were a number of, of issues um, that the appellant raised, and I will go through each of them individually. Um, the first one was the proposal to construct within the stream environment zone, and um, unfortunately, the county doesn't really regulate that. Um, the TRPA code of ordinances um, does have exceptions for allowances of building within that SEZ setback, but to ensure that the project does comply with the TRPA rules and regulations, um, we have added condition number four, um, which requires the applicants to demonstrate approval from TRPA to us before we issue a building permit. The next item of the appeal was the violation of the required five foot side setback. And um, as a result of the conversion of the residential accessory unit to an ADU, um, this is, it now complies, so this is no longer an issue of the appeal. And then the third item was the violation of the minimum eave to property line requirement. And um, with, so there's a couple things. Our zoning ordinance does have a section on projections into that side setback. And with the applicant's um, proposal three, so with the ADU, um, they are proposing a one foot eave projection. And so it will only project, um, it will be three feet from the side property line, which will otherwise comply with the minimum of two feet of allowed eave projection per the code. Um, but again, to further ensure that that is complied with, um, if approved, we have added condition of approval number two that it complies with the section of the zoning ordinance. And then the fourth item was the violation of eave to eave separation. And again, um, that, that is you know, somewhat taken care of through the zoning ordinance, but it's also the building code. And so both of these items, so number four, the violation of the eave to eave separation and the violation of building to building minimum separation um, our building code requirements, and so to ensure that the project does comply and or is built to, um, to meet these code requirements, we've added condition number approval number three, um, which again, they have to demonstrate compliance with the code, the building code. Item number six, um, violation of living space in the required setback um, with 218 square feet of new previously unpermitted living space, and so, uh, uniquely, this, this structure was built in 1940, which was prior to any zoning ordinance standards um, that applied setbacks. So the first zoning ordinance that applied setbacks was in 1957 and zoning ordinance A. And so um, with that, the new, our current zoning ordinance has a non-conforming section, which uh, allows for buildings to maybe enlarged, uh, enhanced or extended or reconstructed, provided that they do not encroach any further into the setback that they're currently violating. And so with this proposal, um, as I mentioned, the width of the existing structure is being reduced from 19 feet to 12 feet, and um, essentially reducing the floor area in that front setback, um, and then ultimately are not asking to protrude any further than what otherwise exists today. So in compliance with the non-conforming section of the zoning ordinance. And the zoning administrator um, at the April zoning administrator hearing further determined that um, with his action of approving the variance. Item number seven, the violation of the fence height within the setbacks and the rights of way of Tahoe and Grove streets and it being six feet tall in the front setback whereas a three foot tall maximum height fence is otherwise um, allowed. The, as I mentioned earlier, there was a determination that the fence, um, based on research that was done by the supervising planner back in 2004, um, that they determined the fence to be legal nonconforming. And so then bouncing back to that legal nonconforming section, anything expanded or enlarged, um, if it doesn't comply with the nonconforming section, then a variance needs to be requested. So that is why one of the items on the variance um, proposal was that extension of the fence to fill in the gap. However, um, it's always important to have the Department of Public Works on board with, with extending fences or asking fences to be in the front setback. Um, and they are in support of the proposal. Um, and that, um, but with the caveat that the extension of that fence has to be located entirely on their property. 
And it's also important to note that the Department of Public Works is also requiring that this pavement in front of the structure be removed. So it will no longer be a driveway encroachment um, that would be of concerns for you know, traffic visibility and the like. So at the April zoning administrator hearing, the zoning administrator also acknowledged the requirements of de the Department of Public Works and the fence as existing legal non-conforming, so further confirming the 2004 um, determination, um, and that was supporting of his approval of the variance request. And so the last item of the appellant's appeal um, was that basically the variance findings cannot be made, but specifically um, he had raised these three points that I'd like to bring up. Um, that due to the new construction of the structure rather than a rebuild, there's the ability to resolve all encroachments. The size and scale of the residential accessory structure is inconsistent with other structures of the neighborhood. And with the application of the required setbacks, the property enjoys 342 square feet of building area, not within the setbacks, and that the request for multiple variances seems an obtrusive, ab abusive effort to build into the setbacks at the community's expense. Um, so, staff reviewed the appeal and, um, and with now the project being proposed as an additional dwelling use to an ADU and in compliance with the, the side setback, the only consideration was to the front setback um, and the front encroachment. And with the existing structure as it exists today, it can be determined that there would be no detrimental um, impacts to proposing a structure actually in, you know, less, less width um, in this location um, and that other structures are currently located within the front setback. As you can see here, this is just down Tahoe Street. So, and then further that, as I mentioned, um, uniquely there has, this, this neighborhood is somewhat dense as it relates to structures that are built um, on these single family parcels that are approximately 5,000 square feet in size. And so um, the zoning administrator found that the structure is in keeping with the residential neighborhood relative to size, scale, height, and the historic nature of the, that resident, or, excuse, residential neighborhood. So with that, staff recommends that the planning commission uphold the decision of the zoning administrator and based upon the applicant's withdrawal of their request to, for a variance to the site setback and their election to modify the use to an ADU, 1.83 feet from the front property line and the construction of a six foot tall fence, zero feet from the front property line along Tahoe Street, subject to the conditions of approval and findings contained in the staff report. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to Thank you, Stacy. very well done. Uh, questions for Stacy staff at this point? I just just have one. By the way, I could have studied that for a year and not given that briefing. So that was <laughs> I know absolutely incredible. <laughs> Three levels, <laughs> uh, truly amazing. Uh, so you made a reference to Senate Bill Nine. Can you explain uh, how that bill influences this proposal? Well, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't necessarily influence it. It's just the zoning administrator acknowledged the trend of that. Now, through Senate Bill 9, you can have up to four units, dwelling units, on a single property. Yeah. Um, and so it was, and you know, I don't want to speak for the zoning administrator, but, but that, that's sort of the new trend of the state of California, right? That more dense development, more dense um, structure, or more structures on a single family parcel than what we're probably otherwise used to. Okay. Right. I guess I Okay. Okay, I guess I'm a little bit confused about the stream. Is it underground? No, no. So the stream environment zone. Um, so here, oh, let's see. So again, it just um, let me go back. Sorry. Um, ah. Um, so. So real quick, um, through TRPA, the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, um, they. Each parcel is analyzed based on its soil type, existing conditions, um, and then based on that, they're given basically either a score or an evaluation on what can be built or how much coverage a single parcel can contain. 
And so in this particular area, and I'm going to just go back one slide so you can kind of see. Um, so this area right here um, uniquely is a preserved area that probably was really wet back, you know, many, many years ago before all of this development has come in. And so um, as a result of probably the characteristic of this um, and then development, the still the indicators of a stream environment zone are still there. And so when this parcel was um, reviewed in 2008, I believe, um, and a site assessment prepared, it was determined that this portion of the parcel still had indicators of a stream environment zone. So um, the site assessment uh, determined that, and that's how the coverage, you know, so then coverage is based on the stream environment zone. So the stream environment zone um, it is an, it, I guess I would say it's an, it's a classification, um, but unfortunately, and I, I don't know the timing, but the structure is built in the stream environment zone. Um, there's actually a lot of improvements in this area, so I'm not sure what came first, right? <laughs> so, um, so at one point, they were, someone was allowed to build in the stream environment zone, but based on the site assessment, that is the classification of the project site. So they're not proposing anything in here. In fact, they really can't um, because of the stream environment zone restrictions of TRPA for adding new coverage in the stream environment zone. I, I guess when I'm looking at the picture, so it looks like it's paved over. Oh, yeah. It's, okay. uh, well, it, it's, yeah, there's a lot of development <laughs> over it, sure. Okay. So it doesn't really act as a stream environment zone, if yeah. maybe that answers You don't see a stream there? No, no. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna bring up the appellant. You guys are okay with that? I'm gonna bring up the appellant, uh, Stephen D. Ganji. Steve D. Ganji. Um. <clears throat> I want to mention a couple of things about the history of city planning. Um, <clears throat> it's been in practice since the third millennium BC. Um, and as an example of how much effort's gone into planning and how much has been handed down to our current planners, if you had 480 planners working full time over a year, that would be l less than 10 per state they would amass one million hours of planning in one year. It's, this has been going on for thousands of years. The rules, the laws, the codes, the regulations that <clears throat> comprise the current compilation of city planning has been in process, as I said, for thousands of years. The restrictions placed on small corner lots including setbacks, fence heights, and placements. They were not mistakes or oversights or forgotten footnotes of planning code. These restrictions are intentional, thoughtful components of city planning. Corner lot development is particularly restrictive with two street setbacks. Not intended to be punitive, but intended to provide corner lots and intersections with more light, more air, and open space. An intention with anticipated effect, not an oversight or a mistake. <clears throat> New state laws may allow ADU construction. They do not abolish the setbacks or the enforcement of setbacks. Setbacks will continue to be a powerful tool to help planners to shape development of communities. Ask, how will the community look in 100 years? Strict adherence to code and regulation is a prescription for development by plan. The future of your work, of your work's positive evaluation, will likely be based on how much development was prevented rather than how much was allowed.
planning staff at Tahoe City is uniquely qualified and equipped. I believe Ms. Widra has been in the planning for 20 plus years. She's a member of the community. <clears throat> Her office is four blocks from this location. She's very familiar with the neighborhood. <clears throat> An interesting thing that I learned during this process is that the first staff report is developed by the staff and it's their thoughts and their experience. All those thousands of years, the millions of hours of planning, Stacy alone, Ms. Weider alone, has something like 40,000 hours in the office of planning. And so if you, her first report is a reflection of that experience. Second and subsequent reports are written by the planning staff, but they are <clears throat> required to adhere to the dis prior decision of the zoning administrator. So basically, the zoning administrator makes a ruling, and then the staff writes something, a subsequent report, to fit that ruling. So the first one is the staff's opinion, subsequent or higher ups opinions that are put into the report. I found that interesting. And it also answered my question as to why the first staff report is vastly different and contrary to subsequent findings by staff. So now I have some items. <clears throat> um, maybe we could go with the fence first. I live, I live next door, I own the property next door to this property. And Joe and Logan, the Carnells, were very dear friends until they moved and sold their house. That fence, now this letter is, I think, muddled at best and certainly inaccurate. The letter that's uh, attachment D um, by the zoning supervisor. He states that the um, existing six foot fence, that fence was not existing, there was no fence. I lived through this fence episode with Joe and Logan. <clears throat> they went and they asked for a <clears throat> permission to build a fence based on, in, in that location, based on historical, and they had some pictures of where there used to be a fence. It was a low fence, just like the fence that was at my house. It was this, they owned three houses contiguous on that block, mine one of them, and they had a picket fence around all three of them, up this tall. You could see through it, it was like a lattice. <clears throat> Joe asked for permission to build a fence in that location. This letter, it's not very clear, but <clears throat> it does say that the, the fence is considered lawful nonconforming as to location, not height. And then it goes on to specify in the last sentence, um, that, that, there's, that the construction not to encroach any further, and note that they're asking for a, an extension, not to extend any further into the setbacks, and it must comply with the height limits. Joe being Joe, built a six foot fence, and nobody called him on it, and it's still there. <clears throat> so I think one question would be, and these, these small inter, in, incremental changes in planning and the effects on a community, it's like aging. You don't see it on a daily basis. But if you go back after 20 years and you see someone or a neighborhood, you can really see those changes. An example would be Carmel by the Sea. 40 years ago, it was small lots, very much like these lots in, in Tahoe City. Small lots, small cottages. Now, and you could wander through these, you could see three or four blocks through these, all, all through. It's very charming, beautiful community. 
now with the development that was been allowed by the county, it's wall to wall buildings. Wall to wall, you can't see through the blocks anymore. It's the light, the air, the charm, it's, it's gone. It took 40 years, but it happened. And it completely changed the dynamic of that neighborhood. As small changes could change the character, which is prescribed by the plan for this tract, <clears throat> the Tahoe Basin Plan, to be preserved. The character is supposed to be preserved. Um, so you have to ask, what would happen if a variance was allowed for a six foot tall fence in the right of way, the county right of way? It's also <clears throat> off of the property. It's supposed, it's on zero, it's supposed to be 20 feet back. So there's a lot wrong with that fence. What, ask yourself, what would happen if, if the neighbor said, well, he has one, I want one. He has one, I want one. And then they could hire a firm like Abby's firm and they could argue, well, there's been a variance. He has one, you need to give me one. And what would happen if you had six foot fences all through Tahoe City on the property line? I think it would very well change the character of the property of the neighborhood and the community. Um, so, and uh, additionally, they're asking for an extension of that fence to further exasperate the fence issue. That extension, this, the same thing could be accomplished through shrubbery. Um, okay, so some simple math. Um, these are these these lots are basically this dimension. They're they're 50 by 110, and if you're on a corner, you get an exception for the front and side setback. If you have an ADU, that side setback goes from five to four. So on this property, you look at it like like this. You'd have Tahoe Street here, Grove Street here. You'd have a 20 foot here. You'd have a 20 foot here, a four foot because the ADU and five foot because of the corner lot exception. Well, if you take <clears throat> the length and the width of the property, you come up with 5,500 feet. They're all about, in that neighborhood, they're all about 5,500 feet. And they're all pretty much the same. So if you take the 5,500 feet and you take out that 3,350 of square feet of excluded by setbacks, then what you're gonna wind up with is 2,150 feet of buildable inside of your buildable envelope. From that, if you take out the 945 feet of this house that's on the property now, you wind up with 1,205 feet of buildable property. That doesn't exclude the SEZ or the SEZ setback. But as staff noted that the, um, the applicant contend, contends that the property, this is from staff report number one, the applicant contends that the property has SEZ hardships. However, the applicant also proposes to develop the project within the SEZ setback, which would suggest that the SEZ itself is not creating a hardship. And as Stacy, Ms. Widra just <clears throat> explained, the stream isn't there anymore. And There's a wet zone just north, it's preserved, but there is, no, there is no stream. And they do plan to build on their proposal in the SEZ. So I believe that my, um, my calculations of the 1,205 available feet are accurate, and it's not 346 feet. That's 1,205 feet inside of the setbacks. Um, and then furthermore, if you were to, Stacy, could I use slide 21, please? Ms. Wade. I didn't want to. 20, uh, 21, I believe. Yes, please. Thank you. Sorry, can, yeah, can you talk in the microphone? You just, you see 
this just push the button the, and it the works. Top. Okay. Yeah. okay, very good. All right. Yeah, so. And if you could, for purposes of the online meeting, if you could just speak no. into the microphone, otherwise oh. the oh, people yes. online might yes. not be able to hear you. Excuse me. So from here to here, um, if you were to put a 24 foot building by 24 foot building right here, you would have eight feet off of the house. You would stay the four feet here, the five feet here, and the 20 foot back. So there is an alternative and it is <clears throat> the least, I forget what the term is, um, deviation from the, um, the code. So there's room to build. And that 24 by 24 comes out to 557, 576 feet of, of area. If they went two stories, it would come out to 1152 feet, which is 48 feet short of the cap of 1200 feet. So there is an alternative and it is a less deviation from code. And that is one of the requirements for an ease for a variance to be issued. I have some um, excerpts from the staff's first report. <clears throat> one, one interesting thing is that staff was unable to find any issued variances in this tract, the uh, fairway tract northeast subdivision. There are no variances. No, no, none have ever been given for a building in a setback, a building in a right, build, right away, or to have living space in a front setback. So this, if this was approved, it would be it would be a precedent. And this precedent would likely be used by firms like <clears throat> Ms. Edwards to, to further other people's desire to build outside of the prescribed area. Um, another note that um, the fairway track northeast for the Tahoe Barrier Plan um, it says it should maintain the existing character. We've spoken about that. Development standards for the fairway track northeast subdivision will require a minimum of a 20 foot setback. Uh, this proposed structure more than doubles the length of the shed. That shed, it was a shed, and Joe and Logan, since I've owned the house, converted it without permits to an office, not a living space. So it was a shed. Now it's a non-permitted office, and it's proposed to be a living space. Again, a living space that's in the setback, in the front setback, in the county right-of-way, and living space in the front setback. Four precedences that have never been granted in this neighborhood through a variance. Um, because this is a teardown and a rebuild, it abolishes all <clears throat> privileges that that building had. It's a do-over when you tear it down. If you were to rebuild it, it's different. But when you, when you, when you tear it down, it's different. Um, staff, and here's some more notes from the, from the first staff report. Staff explained the applicant that it appears that the site and the existing conditions are not suitable for the size, location of the proposed structure. Alternatives exist, including reducing the size of the structure. And again, 
it is the position of the staff that the structure proposed is not the minimum departure. And, and again, she, uh, Ms. Weider states that perhaps too large in size given the parcel size and its limitations. And for the fourth time in the same document, on the same page, staff writes, ultimately, given all of the site characteristics and existing conditions, the size of the resident structure is too big for what the site can reasonably accommodate. Therefore, staff contends that granting this variance will constitute a grant of special privilege inconsistent with the development standards of the Tahoe City Bay Area Plan. And then under the recommendations component, staff recommends that the zoning administrator deny the applicant's request for variance to the front and side setbacks. And then she goes on to findings. Special circumstances that are applicable to the subject property are not so restrictive that without a variance being approved that the residential accessory structure proposed for that site would deprive the property of privileges enjoyed by other properties in the vicinity and under identical zoning. I'm going to depart from these notes for a second to interject one thing. <clears throat> this is one of the flatter parts of this neighborhood. After that, it starts going up a hill. They're all, they're all 50 by 110. And they all have problems. You can hire a firm like Miss Edwards to present all these problems. Oh, it's too steep. It's too rocky. I've got a driveway. The, the innumerable arguments about why I need to get something because I don't, because I want and I want more and I want to put it in areas that were reserved, preserved and reserved to not be built on. <clears throat> the variance, if authorized, would constitute a grant of special, special privilege. So the first thing that I just read about that, about the, just now, that there's conditions that you have to meet to, for a variance. I'm sure you're all aware of them. And so she's going, Ms. Weider is going through them one by one. The variance, if authorized, will constitute a grant of special privilege inconsistent with the limitations upon other properties in the vicinity and the same zone district in that those other properties are also subject to provisions that contain within the Tahoe's area plan. The project proposes a full teardown rebuild resulting in any legal nonconforming rights currently enjoyed by the property to no longer be applied to this property as it would be an entirely new development of the property that would require, that would be required to comply with the development standards contained within the Tahoe City Basin Area Plan implementing regulations. Again, from the staff report. First, the variance, if granted, would be inconsistent with the Tahoe Berry, I'm having trouble with that, Tahoe Basin Area Plan as <clears throat> setback encroachments and would be inconsistent with the development standards that are intended to provide sufficient light, air, open space, snow storage for residential properties. That fence causes problems with snow storage. It all winds up on my property. There's a lot of snow in Tahoe City and <clears throat> having a fence, it just, the snow plow guy has got, he's got, because he's pulling a bunch of snow and there's no room to put it. So he's got to pull it across and put it someplace else. It's your snow supposed to, from the street, supposed to go on your part of the property. The variance, again from the report, number one. The variance, uh, let's see. Further, and this is, I believe, the fourth time she's mentioned it. Further, the size of the proposed structure is too big for what the site can accommodate based on the size of the parcel. The applied setbacks for two roadway frontages, the SEZ and SEZ setbacks. Additionally, existing development demonstrates that additional living space can be provided on the subject parcel, as I pointed out here earlier. 
the rec again from the report number one, the recommendation for denial was based on the comparison of the square footage of the existing structure, 360 square feet, a shed, an unpermitted um, office, to the proposed living space of 468 feet. Approval of the request does not justify the deviation from code. The variance findings cannot be made for the reduction to the re required setbacks based on the existing conditions and application of the required setbacks. The size and scale of the structure is not in keeping with the neighborhood and granting of the variances would not applaud the intention of the setbacks and what they intended to provide. Just a little bit more. Um, ADUs, they're allowed and they're likely coming to neighborhoods. Preservation and enforcement of the county setbacks will lessen the impact of this new type of development and help to preserve the character of the neighborhoods as the plan <clears throat> demands. To grant variances that allow building and living space in setbacks, there are no known variances that have been granted to build in the setbacks, no variances that have been granted to build living space or in the right-of-way or in the frontage. <clears throat> so this would be truly a precedent variance. <clears throat> Giving those away would likely have negative consequences on the track's character and diminish the county's ability in future requests for this type of variance. So on a personal note, <clears throat> this area has really been just near and dear to me. And so it's not just about I'm the neighbor and I want something there. And I think you can tell from what I've <clears throat> talked about, it's an overall, it's the community and how, how allowing or, or issuing variances, especially ones that, are <clears throat> that have never been issued before, will diminish your ability to further control these ADU developments. I want an ADU and I want to put it in the right of way, I want to put it in the setback, I want to put it on the frontage, on and on. There's a lot of reasons that this should not be allowed for the future of the community. Thank you very much for listening and for taking this in. All right, thank you, Mr. Kanji. Um, stick around, we might have questions for you or you just need... one quick question. Where is your house located? Oh, Open my house. house? is not allowed to leave here my house is here this is grove street yeah this is um tahoe oh, this street. is tahoe street and my house is on the corner of pioneer and tahoe so you're not directly next door pardon me you're not directly next door why well, am directly next door. oh you yes. are yes, this sir. is two yeah, houses we're, right. we're separated by two sheds. oh got it thank you so i saw this you I, that, that slide, I have it just for clarification please. i have it thank you i got it okay we're good thank you There's my shed. There we go. So there's there's the applicants, applicants' shed, my shed, my house. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. For sure. Any other questions right now? Okay, thank you. We'll call you back up if we have questions. I'd like to bring up the applicant. Uh, Kaufman Edwards, uh, if you have some comments. Good afternoon, 
Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, my name is Abby Edwards, and I'm with Kaufman Edwards Planning and Consulting. And I've worked with the Wiseman since they purchased the property in June of 2020. This is a slide showing the existing structure that was built in 1940. So here's some more photos of existing conditions at the Wiseman's property. Um, this view is from Tahoe Street, looking towards the elementary school. And the picture on the right shows our existing garage that was built in 1940 and Mr. DeGange's garage that's next door. So this is the view of Mr. DeGange's property that he rents um, from his driveway, which is to the right of his garage. You can see um, several cars parked there. You can see some large trees. And in the back, you can see some other accessory structures that are located at the property behind. Actually, I'm going to go back. So our proposed structure um, with the four-foot setback will be located approximately 19 feet to the left of the two large trees that you can see. Oh. So about 19 feet to the left will be the new structure to give you an idea of scale. So this is just, Stacey did a really good job of explaining our chronology. <laughs> Um, we've, we've been working on this project a long time. Um, I initially started working with the Wisemans in June of 2020, explained the hardships on the property. They were well aware when they purchased it. Um, we made our original submittal to add on to the existing structure in December of 2020. Um, immediately, we got some response from public works um, and planning on you know, requests on modifications they wanted us to consider before we proceed. One of the main concerns was the building frontage along Tahoe Street. Um, they requested us to make that more narrow. Um, they wanted, we have two driveways, which is actually against the current code at Placer County. So we are actually removing our second driveway right here and revegetating that will provide more snow storage for the county right away. We also originally were considering an 18 foot tall structure that was very square and had more mass and had the less setback. Um, so we went to the March 17th hearing and we continued because the zoning administrator asked us to do some modifications to maybe make the, you know, work with Mr. DeGange and make the property a little more conforming, the new structure. Um, we submitted an updated variance. As a result, we gave um, more, more distance between Mr. DeGange's property and, and ours for snow shed. Right now, there's basically no room for snow shed. The current proposal with the ADU is four feet, which will really improve the snow problem. Um, or any shedding. We're also proposing an uh, asphalt pump shingle roof, which will end cleats on the roof so that there's no impact of snow on Mr. DeGange. With the updated modifications, so we also um, decreased the height and we added more articulation to the building. It's now a stepped design, so it's going to be 16 feet in the middle, uh, tall. Um, it's also going to be 14 feet on each end. So I feel like we really improved the structure from the original, um, our original um, variance request that Mr. DeGange is mentioning all the, um, all of the notes and the original recommendations on the size of the building. So we've really brought the size and the height down. And in April 2020, April um, 2022, we were approved by the zoning administrator. Um, I also want to mention that the fence, as part of our review with the county, we've also um, been asked to improve the sight distance of the existing fence at the corner of Tahoe and um, Grove Streets. There is a school across the street, so we are 
um, modifying the fence to allow the upper three feet of the six foot tall fence to be open so you could see there's certain uh, visibility requirements per code. So again, here's our current proposal. Um, I just went over most of these. We decreased the width at the street. We, decreased, or we increased the side setback. Um, we're painting the house darker colors and materials than are there now, so that complies with TRP and county code. And then the county actually, um, they also asked us, because we were proposing living there in the front setback, to remove all windows within the front setback, so we've done that. Here's the existing structure. It's a light tan with dark brown with windows in the right of way. We're proposing, it actually doesn't look as dark as the real, <laughs> the real color is, but the real color is going to be quite a bit darker um, with a lighter trim. So Stacy did a really good job of laying out what the um, neighborhood is like. Um, it's a very dense neighborhood. It's a very old neighborhood. Most of these structures are built in the 1940s um, before TRP in the county existed. So the reason why a lot of variances haven't been obtained are because the structures are already existing in the front setbacks. Um, it's really hard to read. Here's the elementary school. This is the Wiseman's property. Um, here's the property next door. Um, so the Wiseman residence is 18 feet tall. Mr. DeGange's garage um, right here is about 11 feet tall. Um, to the north, actually this is north, there's a 14 foot tall shed right here, right in the setback. The next door neighbor has um, a, a garage that's 15 feet tall in the side setback. And then right here is the AT&T industrial building, which is between three and four stories high. So our design is actually pretty consistent with the neighboring structures on height. 14 and 16 feet um, is actually not as tall as some of the surrounding structures. So here's the Wise, oops. So here's the Wiseman property again, and here's the corner. And this is the portion of the fence that we're improving for sight distance. This is the at t building. As you can see in this picture, the at t building is probably four stories tall. Here's the next door neighbor to Wiseman. This is the 16 or 15 foot tall garage that's fairly close to us. This is the 14 foot tall shed. This is a two story residence. Mr. DeGange has a two story residence. Again, we're pretty consistent. So I wanted to talk a little bit, I hadn't planned on really talking about the SEZ, but I, I, I have a pretty heavy involvement in soils analysis. Um, so TRPA, when they come out and they, you know, they determine the land capability of a property, um, they take a look at the characters of the soils, any vegetation, if there's groundwater, you know, near the surface. Um, but in order to, to be stream environment zone, there has to be, you know, a previous presence of high groundwater table, modeling in the soil within three feet, things like that. So even though there's not an actual stream on the property, um, it was determined by the county to be SEZ based on how it was mapped on the old 1970 or 87 TRP soils maps. Um, a lot of the, we're actually, um, so actually here's gonna be the location of the new structure. As you can see, there's a two-story structure, a shed. We're removing some of, um, and then here's Mr. DeGange's garage. Um, the new structure will extend about 16 feet past that. And all of this, will, this section will be removed. Yes, this is where the fence will go. The fence, you know, we're not asking, we're just asking to extend the fence where there was a previously a non-conforming building in the setback. So, so how t TRPA coverage works is you cannot add coverage in the area that's been determined stream environment zone. That's, um, if you move coverage around in the stream environment zone, it's a one and a half to one relocation, so you get less coverage. 
The setback can be relocated one-to-one -one, but not increased. And then the class five coverage, which is the very corner where we're proposing the building. Um, so basically what we're doing is we're decreasing our, our coverage in the stream environment zone and moving it closer to the less sensitive soil. So that's kind of why it's proposed in the location that it's at. So there's gonna be a net decrease in coverage in the stream environment zone and the setback. So the benefits resulting in this project, um, as I just mentioned, are bringing the property into conformance and removing unverified coverage. The previous owner added this deck. We'll be removing all of that, restoring it. We're improving the site distance at the corner of Grove and Tao Streets. We're removing a second driveway per public works requests for more snow storage and to meet the requirement or the code for one driveway allowed per parcel. We're decreasing the building frontage along Tahoe Street. Um, the county requested less of a width of a building. That's kind of why we moved that square footage to the back, is that they wanted less frontage of living area along the Tahoe uh, Street right of way. So that's why the building's getting longer. And darker colors and materials, and we've decided to do, I mean, you know, we were considering doing an ADU to start with, um, so we're we're just proposing an ADU and moving the property or the building over another six inches so we completely conform to the side step back. And I believe that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you, Abby. Any questions? <clears throat> no question, I guess. Uh, there's a, an existing driveway there yes. that goes up to the existing shed. Yes. And so uh, basically a portion of that driveway is within the uh, county's right-of-way, is that correct? The entire driveway is in the county right-of-way. Okay. And that's, that's the second driveway is the one that's in front of the shed, garage. And it's not the standard 20 feet in uh, length? Um, so there's two driveways on the property, so I can go back. So there's two driveways currently on the property. There's a driveway over here off Grove Street. This is the elementary school side. And then there's the secondary driveway that's been there since the garage was built in 1940. But the current code, and both this driveway is completely within the county right of way. And it actually extends the 1.83 into our property before the, the garage, existing garage is located, but we're removing that entire driveway because uh, Public Works has asked us to, because new projects that are coming through the queue with the code that says you're only allowed one driveway, they're asking people that are proposing projects to conform to current standards. When looking at cars parked in that driveway, uh, modern cars wouldn't be able to fit totally on the driveway, right? Um. You have a pickup truck. I would that's say so. The long. building, the building frontage is 16 feet from the edge of pavement, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's in the travel way. Um, so it's a pretty, it's, 16 it's a feet pretty driveway. short driveway. Yeah, and normally they need to be at least 20 feet. Yes. Under the current. 20 feet from mm -hmm. edge of pavement. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have about. 14. You had said that the fence that's going to be along Tahoe and Grove Streets, the six foot high fence, the top three feet are going to be open visibility. Mm -hmm. And I think Stacy had said, and you might be able to answer the question about the minimum eave requirement between the properties, they're going to be within the limits, right? They're not going to overlap or, okay. Because in Mr. DeGange's um, memo dated May 1st, 2020, he was talking about violating the Eve to Eve separation. Um, and I just want to make sure that we weren't doing that in this new design. That, not with the new design, but that was, um, there was an encroachment, I believe, in option one that has now been modified. Uh, 
Uh, I have a question probably for Stacy. Looking at the pictures with the two garages, um, they both sit within the set, a 20 foot setback. So they're both technically illegal. Yes. So with the new proposal with the Edwards, they will be further back and no. will they, they still will not be within the setback limits. Correct? They, right. They'll be in the front setback, but this one will have a variance to basically um, solidify it in its location. Um, so this is the applicants. It's going to be reduced. So this section over here is going to be gone. Right. Um, and that's where they want to 12 put the feet fence. wide, right. And um, Commissioner Johnson, just to clarify, this portion of pavement that's in the front here will be removed and revegetated so that no one will park here anymore oh, yeah. up to the property line. Um, I was just getting clear that uh, yeah, it will be just now. Right. Not, it wouldn't meet our current standards. Yes, agreed. Um, but it will have to be, you know, the pavement removed and, and revegetated. Um, but yes, so um, Commissioner DiMatte, this structure is also located in the front setback. Um, it might be a couple inches set back than, than this property. I, I can't remember. It's been, been a while. And they were prior to 1940, both of these, so they're probably mm -hmm. way before the variance. Correct. Also, my next thought is removing the pavement and adding a fence, isn't that going to decrease snow storage? If you go put vegetation there, are they limited to what they could put? If they put a tree there, you're not going to put snow there. Well, so isn't it better to just leave it as is and and not put a fence to extend it because then you're taking away snow storage. Well, you're you're not actually um, the snow storage. So <laughs> it's kind of so the this area here, which was where people would park, so snow would be removed from it, mm -hmm. and it would have to be stored somewhere. Now, um, when you remove this pavement, snow can just fall and stay there. And the snow removed from Tahoe Street from the county snow removal operators can be also placed here. Not that they wouldn't not place it there, even with the driveway, they, they still would. But then the, the driveway would have to be cleared. So the snow, you know, so it's, it's a, you know, you're kind of chasing your tail. So with this removal of this driveway and pavement, there's actually more snow storage that will be accommodated. You know, it sounds funny, but because then we don't have to remove this, the, the owners don't have to remove the snow from this driveway. Mm -hmm. So it will fall and it will be pushed from the road. So it will just stay. Um, a dirt pavement, I would imagine it's the same surface area, but. Okay. Well, but then it allows someone to actually plow it like and use it as a parking space. And then furthermore, that's what de the Department of Public Works does not want. They so don't they want people parking So they think by removing the pavement, you won't park there? Well, and revegetated, so there should be some growth of vegetation there that hopefully will. But you can, and then by putting the fence there and extending it the where that open area is. No, we're not fencing. You're not fencing that in. No. The fence is to the back. If you, if you look to the left of the, where the, our garage is, where our garage is. Yeah. Okay, is that the left? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the fence line, it doesn't, so it's, come, out. It doesn't come out. So it's not going down Tahoe Street. It's no. going back into your property. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Sorry. Thank you. No, I missed that more question. No, I thought it was going straight down the okay. street. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. It's an extent, basically extension of this fence here. Yeah, we got it. Okay. Do you have a comment? Yeah, I have, well, not a comment. Because we're still questioning. Put on your mic. Yeah, I guess we're not into comments yet, but I do have a question in that uh, what it looks like is you have two front. Since you're a corner lot, you have two front. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my memory bank, at one time, it seemed like we dealt with that in some kind of an ordinance change where yes. they could just have one. Right. Well, unfortunately, yes, you're referring to the street side setback that has been implemented into the county zoning ordinance. It has not yet made its way into the Tahoe Basin area plan. So okay. we're working on that. But um, so your, your memory bank is doing great. But uh, we're, we're, we will be introducing that into the Tahoe Basin area plan amendments. Um, but currently, it's not applicable. Okay, thank you. 
Stacy, a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Deganji liberally quoted a uh, previous staff report, first staff report. Um, those quotations, were they accurate? Yes, I believe he read right out of the original staff report that is actually an attachment to your your staff report packet, and I can okay, grab so, it. Okay, so so under those circumstances, you recommend a denial by the zoning administrator. You indicated that the variances were a special privilege, which is not permitted. Okay. Uh, you indicated that the current proposal is too large for the lot. Are those accurate statements? Proposal number one. Okay, it's so, relevant to those comments. Okay, yes. so the staff report that he was quoting dealt with proposal one, oh, not no. proposal three. Correct. Okay, all right. And Thank a, you. Um, that was and, just that was not clear to me. It may have been clear to everybody else, but it was not clear. Sure, to me. and uh, and um, and just within that that analysis of proposal one, staff did acknowledge that. Um, that although staff may be supportive of a variance to the front setback due to site constraints, staff encouraged the applicant to relocate, relocate the new structure to avoid an encroachment into the side setback. Right. Um, and so it was really, that was the proposal number one's issue um, that staff was having. And that's been rectified. Okay, mm -hmm. so yes. um, there was also a comment that said that no other variances <laughs> in this tract have been granted. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, I mean, I, I tried to do the best I could as far as research goes. I cannot um, say I went to every single parcel, but I did in the general vicinity, um, and I was unable to find any variances to setbacks. I found variances to densities, and that's what um, I indicated in the staff report. Okay. So, in some ways, uh, the appellant's viewpoint on this would be accurate in that it would be precedent setting for this community to grant these variances. Uh, sure. Um, okay. The, I will just note for the record that um, a lot of these homes, and like he mentioned, um, were built prior to any setback. Um, requirements and so a lot of these structures are very old and um, and and again not it was they were built if they were built prior to 1957 that's when setbacks were first introduced to this area see I have a question do we understand that mr. Deganje is the renter of the property next door no he is the owner but okay. he has renters who rent his house thank you Does the current fence at the corner of Tahoe Street and Grove Street um, make it an unsafe corner to turn right to be able to see? And is it proposed by staff to have them remove that? Well, so um, right Being here. It's in the setback as well. Yes, it is. Um, and, and then just about, oh gosh, maybe a couple months ago, uh, our Tahoe City Public Utility District came in and installed a um, sidewalk corner. Um, there's not, there's no sidewalks. It's just a, um, it's a cross. Thank you. It's a crosswalk. But over on this side, it's um, it's organized now. It has the um, like the braille. If you're there's a picture that was. Oh, did I? Can we bring that up? Trying to think. <coughs> Ah, right here. Yeah. So, oh, it's a. Oh, this is great. No, this is it. This is installed. Um, so this this is just. I mean, we're talking couple months newly right. constructed. Um, so yes. Yeah, so this portion of the fence here, um, because if a vehicle is parked behind this white line, they it's they have to inch out to be able to see beyond this fence. So it's in this area that the fence will be improved to comply with. Um, plate, I forget what plate number is, I can look it up, but it's the Department of Public Works um, requirements for adequate site distance. Okay. Stacy, with the addition of the ADU and occupancy, will driveway one fulfill the required parking spaces? Yes. Okay. And furthermore, they're within um, uh, 
they're in close proximity to a transit stop, so technically they don't need yeah, parking right. space for the okay. ADU. Does the fence also on Grove Street also impede the 20 foot setback? Mm hmm. They both do. And those were there prior to the owner, current owner buying that property, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, Stacy, the, the appellant indicated that there are that there were other options uh, potentially available, right? Um, that would uh, that would be less of uh, would require less of a variance, I suppose you could say. Mm -hmm. Is that an accurate statement? I mean, are there other op alternatives available here in terms of construction, et cetera? Well, of course, right? Um, so that would get that would get to the, you know, the ADU and make it a little yeah. bit of space, et cetera. I I think um, what, and I let me just go back really quick so I can, um, I feel like a picture is, is worth a thousand words. So it's hard to see on this picture, but I think it it really is um, the the most visible. Basically, this area right here, and actually, um, let's go five feet over. So, because here's the front 20 foot setback. Here's, let's just say the five foot is here. So this little triangular piece is what could be developed if outside of the 10 foot SCZ setback. Now, if they have the coverage and they can um, do, you know, if they, let's just, I'll just leave it at that. If they have the coverage and can build in this SCZ setback, then yes, this would be sort of the triangular area of which they could construct in. Um, but it's not, you know, we, we don't encourage development in that SCZ setback, um, but that would, that's what Mr. DeGangi, I think, was referring to. Um, but one item that I'm afraid, and I, I wrote down in some of my notes, um, I wasn't sure if he was factoring in this area, because here's the front setback. So it's, it's a really narrow, limited building envelope. Um, if you apply the 10 foot SEZ setback as well. Okay. With the SEZ setback, this is with the ADU, I'd imagine there's gonna be a bathroom there. Are the sewer line's gonna have to cross through that and they're gonna have to dig it up to put, attach that sewer line to Grove Street or to Tahoe Street or the existing sewer system that's on the house? It might be on the road here. Um, I'm, I, we, I know I, ha I haven't dove into those, you know, that would be the building plans that they'd have to um, we demonstrate that, where and how they will access If this that. gets approved, then they would be allowed to go through that or not? Yeah, they would have to get TRPA's approval. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can we move to public comment? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Stacy. We're going to, um, do you have something to add? Yeah, just I'd like to just have a minute. Okay. Hi, I'm, I'm John Wiseman. My yeah. wife and I own the yeah. house. Yeah, yeah. Um, I liked your comment about how you could read this for a long time and not get your head around it. We've been in this for a couple of years now, and it's 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 mind-boggling, right? Um, the reason that there's there's no variances to this thing is no one no one bothers to go through the process and get a variance. They just build and they just call it a day, and that's what it is. Can you go back? I think it's a slide that shows the two garages. So before we bought this this house, you know, we knew it had one bathroom and we wanted to have a little bit of living area. So uh, my wife and I decided we we'd build like a like a little workout room and and um, uh, the bathroom and then a little office so I could work up there when I was when we were up here. And then uh, if you look at if you look right here on the on the right hand side, you can see where our garage is. You can see where Mr. DeGange's garage is. Um, every house around us is two stories. We're the smallest one, and we're, we're kind of stuck down in the corner there. Uh, we, we've gone through so many iterations of what to build and what not to build, and the height doesn't seem to be restricted in any way. So what basically came down to what Mr. DeGange is mentioning that I understand him to mean is that we, you know, we could go two stories, right? But because of the footprint, and I did tell Mr. DeGange, I don't want to build an elevator shaft back there. I want to keep it Tahoe-y. We want to make it match the existing home. We want to make it nice. We want to have it, have it fit in. Every single lot around us has a building that's within the setbacks, the five-foot setback. 
Mr. DeGange's garage is 18 inches from my property line. We're now proposing to build something four feet away from that. So we'll be over five feet away from his garage, which doesn't follow the rules. He has a pizza oven in his front yard that is, that's run by propane that's right up against a wooden fence. That it is, there's zero inches for the setback. If you had a 20-foot setback for the fence, it would be in my bedroom. It's, it's a very tight little uh, area. So we've gone to great lengths and we've spoken to all the neighbors and we've given them all plans and we've talked to them. We've got an approval from my neighbor on, on, on the right side up Grove Street. The, the gentleman that lives right next to Mr. DeGange, we, we talked with him and we talked it through because we want to be good neighbors. And, and Mr. DeGange is, is uh, I, I kind of scratched my head because it's, oh, it's like rules for thee but not for me. If, if everyone in that neighborhood had to conform, let's just take a, take a look at his, for example, his garage should go away. I'm not proposing that. I don't think it should happen. But logic would dictate, you know. So, you know, before we bought the property, one thing Steve said to me, he said, hey, you should have thought about this before you bought your property. And then he, he talks about the history of, of property development. Well, I'm pretty sure the Indians don't want us here building anything, right? So... Things progress, times change, things move on, and that's why there's a process for a variance. So we, we've been through the process for a couple of years now, and we've, we've conformed to every single thing that they've asked us to do. The, the shape of that um, building is due to the SEC. We're respecting the Tahoe Regional Planning uh, people. We, we, we found the spot that we can put it in. We've made it lower. We've made it beautiful. Uh, and we've just, just done everything that we can to please everybody. Uh, Stacy's been fantastic. Mr. DeGange quotes from his report, from her report extensively, but it's the first report. And we've been through the process all the way down the line, and we've been good neighbors, and we've been good citizens, and we've spent the money, and we've done everything right. So I, I, I just would hope uh, that his appeal will be denied, and we'll be able to move forward with this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open public comment at this time. Anyone here in person wish to, you've already spoken, uh, but I'll take other public commenters. Um, anyone online? Okay. I, I do want to give you a chance to come back up. So um, I'm going to close public comment at this time, and I'd like to invite Mr. Uh, DeGange back up. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the difference between my shed uh, built in the 40s is it's not habitated. It's a big difference there. I'm not asking to, to have people live there. Um, and um, I think that there's a direct correlation between the money spent and the time it's taken to the in inappropriateness of this project. This project was a was an easy, appropriate project, it would have been approved. Um, uh, Mr. Woodward asked about um, if my comments from the first report and the second, um, the difference in the, in the building is it's 12, they removed from the very, from here's the building, they removed it's 12 feet wide. They removed one foot from the back of the building, so it's so it's tw so it's 12 feet by one foot. It's 12 square feet smaller. However, they added on this side of the building, they added 20 feet by one and a half feet. So that's 30 feet addition. So the building now is 18 feet, 18 square feet larger in this rendition than it was in the rendition that I was reading from. So I believe that the comments of from Ms. Widra about too much on too little are still relevant, if not more so, with the added square footage. Um, <clears throat> again, I'd like to bring up the these ADUs and the application process, it's an opportunity for the county to clean some of these things up. If I was to go in and say, hey, I want to build something. Well, Steve, you need to clean up 
that shed. Okay, so you get rid of one shed. Um, subsequent to the, and another thing about how many square feet are available here, <clears throat> and you saw the arcs that come through here. Um, you can see that this arc here and this arc here are the setback. You can see where the proposed structure is proposed to be in the SEZ. Well, it's right here's the SEZ setback, right here. SEZ setback. If I'm reading this correctly, here's the building. And this portion of the building is proposed to be in the SEZ setback. Yeah, I want to make sure we get everything in the record so whoever's at the mic can speak, but if you request someone else to come up, so. Um, <clears throat> Stacy. So just for clarification, um, this is the SEZ setback. So this area, this is the line of the SEZ. This is the 10 foot SEZ setback. So they are proposing in the setback only, not in, they're not proposing to construct in the SEZ. Oh, and then subsequent to the establishment of these SEZs, there was a major infrastructure and drain and curb project that, that was done. And so that would <clears throat> go to the, um, whether or not this SEZ is still applicable or not. Um, there, there was a stream that would run in my, my time on the property, it would run from my property through here, through this property, and then into the, the holding area here. But on the street, on uh, Pioneer Street, they put on the far side of Pioneer Street over here, they put a, a, a curb and gutter and some drainage and swells that go into a drain now. So they basically redirected all the water that was going into that SEZ. So the likelihood of, of, of TRPA um, allowing this is, is much greater than it would have been prior to the um, infrastructure improvements with the curb and gutter and drains. I believe that's it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, thank you. I think um, I'll bring it back to the commission now for discussion. Uh, and if we need to ask more questions, we can. But um, sure, sure. Come on up, Abigail. That's fine. I just wanted to clarify that the area that's in the SEZ setback is actually the class five soil type. However, it is in the setback. I also wanted to clarify that we are removing coverage out of the SEZ, um, such as the shed to the left and a lot of deck, and we're moving it out of the SEZ into the class five. We're reducing the SEZ coverage and removing structures and re we're reducing um, coverage in the SEZ setback, which is class five soil. Okay, thank does you. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay, let's uh, commission discussion on this item. I could get just one clarification from staff and uh, this I think can be pretty succinct because we've had this discussion but you make the statement that there are no special circ there that there are special circumstances for this property in your judgment and that this is not a special privilege applicable to this parcel can you defend that that briefly? was the zoning administrators determination is that staff's yes. position yes. your position yes now with proposal three. Okay. Why? Succinctly. Why do you believe there is no special privilege being applied to this property? And why 
do you say there are special circumstances? Well, now that they comply with the four-foot side setback, the only consideration is to the front. And the front currently today will have has more encroachment than what would be or what is now proposed. Okay. I I uh, I guess let me restate this. Staff's position is there are no special circumstances. There are special circumstances for this property. What are those? that um, two frontages, the SEZ, the SEZ, well, the SEZ limitations, um, also that the non-conforming section of the zoning ordinance um, would otherwise allow this without the variance as well. Um, but because of the progression of where we've got to where we are today, um, I didn't have that allowance of the non-conforming section. So should they had just come in with proposal number three where they complied with the four foot side setback um, i would have been able to go to the planning director and ask for a planning director's determination that the non-conforming section does apply to this circumstance and it would in that they are not proposing to expand or enlarge into that front setback that otherwise exists today and further i have support or supporting documentation that the structure was built in 1940, so prior to any zoning ordinance setback standards. Okay. Stacy, I think you outlined that on page 10 of 18 where you had the response to the appeal where you said, um, talking about the proposal to construct the stream in the SEC, and then your staff response goes back and talks about the setbacks. Mm -hmm. So that's page 10 and 11 of staff response to the appeal. In the, in the main document. So I think all the detail for that mm -hmm. question that Commissioner Woodward's asking is. Yeah, it is contained in the staff report as well. Thank you. Stacy, one last question for me. If they left that wall that's on Tahoe Street there where the windows are and just added on to that, it'd still be in compliance because it was there prior to 1940, 1950, right? So it would just be an addition. They wouldn't go into the mm -hmm. stream. They would be still in the setback. Right. So. By knocking it down and setting it back, they're getting dinged. Mm -hmm. So if they just said, hey, we're going to leave this wall here and we're going to just add on, would that just clear everything up? Or would that just, I mean, knock it out of this mm -hmm. problem? Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking for other people who live in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. too. I'm just trying to think outside the box that, you know, if it's a, a remodel and not a teardown. Right. It, well, I thought it was determined that uh, the current structure would not support the new design. I think we heard that. Yeah, new they're, design or new. Their engineer new engineering structure. Um, mm -hmm. basically said, and and they can speak. You know, I I did not have this conversation with the engineer, but but between the original proposal that they submitted with their application to proposal one. Um, some information that was found during that time was also that the structural integrity mm -hmm. of that structure could not withstand a what what you're kind of alluding to, right. um, but maybe a one wall. Sure, I'm not, but I'm I mean, not sure. Buildings that were built a hundred years ago are retrofitted for today's standards, sure. in the, especially in the Bay Area with mm -hmm. earthquakes. So I mean, we're talking about a wall that's only ten feet wide by twelve feet high, right. made out of two by fours. Right, that could be easily restructured to. Solve that problem, correct? Sure, but it was the elective of the applicants to. I just to asked. Go. Thank okay. you. Great. That's fine. Can we go back to the uh, recommendation? We're ready for a motion. So uh, basically, uh, us as a commission uh, to uphold the decision of the zoning administrator and based upon the applicant's withdrawal of their request for a variance to 
the side setback and they're alleged to modify the use to uh, an accessory dwelling unit ADU, 1.83 feet from the front property line and the construction of a six foot tall fence, zero feet from the front property line along the top of the street, subject to the conditions of approval and findings contained in the section. I'll second. We have a first and a second. It's a roll call vote. I have a first from Commissioner Johnson and a second from Commissioner Dahlgren. Commissioner Hauge? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Yes. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Thank you. The decision of the Planning Commission may be appealed by anyone who appeared at today's hearing and provided comment or anyone that submitted written comments on this item. An appeal must be filed within 10 days of today's date and shall be accompanied by, a, uh, accompanied by a filing fee of $641. Thanks everyone, uh, participation today. Thank you commissioners, great job. Thoughtful questions and staff, great job. We'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting.